Good morning. I want to welcome you here. We're going to roll right into worship today. So join with me as we sing this song. There is a song I know it well A melody that's never failed On mountains high and valleys low My soul will rest my confidence in you I want to welcome you here, and I want to thank you so much for uh, for joining me. I want to thank you so much for inviting me into your home this morning. And uh, you know, I I just want to say this: I miss you. I miss you dearly. I miss worshiping with you. I miss getting together with you. 
But I know that we are united in Christ. I know that we are together in Christ. And I know that this will only be temporary and we'll be together again. But it's still hard, isn't it? I'm thankful that we can come together in this way. Um, I want to encourage you to join us on Zoom after the service as well, 1130. Um, that link is on the website. And, uh, and you can check the website for all the new news and happenings and things like that. But today, this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you're watching this, we have come together to worship God. We've come together because he is our hope, because Christ is our hope. He's our portion. He's our, he's our God. He's our Lord. And he is worthy of worship. <laughs> and we need him. We need him badly. We need him badly. So friends, let's take just a moment to prepare our hearts and minds to go before him, to come before him, to, to encounter the risen Lord. Let's prepare ourselves to worship God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for all that you give us. We are so in awe of your wonder and your grace. We are in awe of your mercy towards us. God, I pray that you would soften our hearts, that we might show mercy to others. You would, you would give us eyes to see where others need grace. God, as we look out upon a world with renewed restrictions with turmoil in our neighbor to the south. And God, we recognize the turmoil in our own hearts, in our own minds. God, I pray that you would bring us peace. I pray that you would calm our hearts and minds. Lord, I ask that you would, you would encounter us in a new way this week. You would come, bef- you would come to us in a new way and we would see you hear from you in a brand new way for, through your word, Lord. And yet, God, we, we look at all the blessings that you give us. We look at this beautiful place we have to live. We look at the technology that we have to still connect. God, we look and see that regardless of what happens in our lives, that, that you have us and you hold us. Lord, we pray for uh, for those who are struggling with health issues or are still walking through recovery. We pray that recovery would be swift and healing would come. God, we pray for those who are dealing with mental health issues and we pray that, uh, that you would bring them peace of mind. Father, we pray for those who are having financial or family problems. And God, more than anything this morning, I just pray for those who are struggling they're just not right because this world's just not right and they just can't put their finger on it God I pray that you would hold them in your hands God I pray that you would hold me in your hands Lord God give us an eternal vision give us eyes to see the eternal that we might See as you see and and love as you love, God. God, give us the opportunity to reach out to our neighbors, to share the good news of the gospel, to share our hope with others. God, give us opportunity to do that. And then give us the courage to step into it when it comes. God, you are so good. You are so, so good to us. We can stand strong and firm because we know that when you're with us, nothing can stand against us. Because we share in your victory. Not because we are strong, but because you're strong. So Lord, hold on to us now. Be with us as we look into your word. God, be with all your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's, uh, let's continue in song.
So our scripture reading today comes from the book of Ephesians. It's not the text I necessarily be uh, preaching on, but it comes from the book of Ephesians, and it's uh, Ephesians 1, 3 to 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is the word of the great and sovereign God. Well, oh, where am I here? Here we go. Move that over there. Move me over there. There, that's better. So, I spent a lot of time praying and thinking about what what this sermon series was uh, was going to be, uh, what to preach this year, what to preach to begin the year, to start to start off 2021, and uh, it always seems like a big decision as to to what to preach at the beginning of the year because uh, they think well it's going to set the tone for the whole year and um, and maybe it does, uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, uh, you know maybe the reality is that by the time February rolls around, who remembers what happens at the beginning of January, but. But for me, anyway, I think it sets the tone for the entire year as to where we're going. And, uh, and it's been hard to have, to have um, an outlook, to have a vision. I'm not saying about a vision, vision, but like to have vision looking ahead to this year because we don't know what's going to come. And so as I put this together, I had some thoughts of other books of the Bible, you know, maybe we should look at different things. Uh, what are some things we could, we should do, but I kept being brought back to these books. I kept being brought back to first and second Timothy. And as I read them over and over again, um, and listened to them, I began to see why these two letters to Timothy are intensely relevant to our world today. They address many of the issues we're facing right now. Many of the issues that we, that we face today, They talk of our place in the church, something that's been blurred by the restrictions on meeting, right? What's our real place in the church? You know, if we can't serve the way we used to, and this can't serve the way we've been used to, how do we fit in? What does it mean to be part of a church if we can't gather? And this past year, you know, we've been challenged with all kinds of new ways of doing things. We've been challenged with what it looks like to live out our faith in the midst of a global pandemic. And there are a multitude of articles, videos, podcasts, and more about how we should be acting, about what a person should be doing, about what a Christian should be doing. Right? There's all kinds of articles on, on all sides of the spectrum about, you know, the, the truthfulness of that. I'm not, I'm not going to get into any of that. This is where we are. This is the context that we're in right now. So how do we navigate it and how do we glorify Christ in this context? So instead, we're going to look at these letters that are inspired by the Holy Spirit um, to see what God says about how we're to conduct ourselves within the church. See, one of the biggest challenges in not meeting is not knowing how we fit when we're not together. It's it's easy when we meet together. It's, it's a lot easier when we meet together because um, one makes the coffee, one cleans up, one greets, one sings, one preaches, one runs the computer, and so on and so on. But when we strip all that away, what's one to do? How do we serve one another when we lose our jobs? And even further than that, once we understand how we fit into the church, how does the church fit into our world? What place does it have? Should the church be on the forefront of protest? Standing against the tyranny of the government? 
Or should the church be a voice for, for peace and obedience to the government? What place does the church have in the world? Does the church have a voice at all in the world or has it been so silenced and marginalized that no one's going to hear anyway? What witness do we give to how we live our lives out in the world through the local church? And inside the local church, there's things we face as well. You know, how do we navigate um, the increased polarization in views? How do we find unity when there's such disparate views about how to live? Who are we to serve? And how are we to serve them? So why First and Second Timothy? Well, it speaks to our context right now. It brings up relevant issues. It tackles hard topics. And over the course of this series, which, um, which is going to take up to May, so I got it planned out up to May, as we take the scriptures seriously for what they say, and we're going to be careful to take them seriously for what they say, not what we want them to say, not what we assume that they say or think they should say, but what the scriptures actually say. I, as we do this, my prayer is that we're going to find our place in the local church, that we're going to be challenged and empowered to live rightly, and that God would speak through his word to those places in our lives where we need to hear him. So the heart of these two letters, which together with, uh, with Titus are known as the pastoral epistles. Epistle is a fancy word for letter, and they're written to pastors. So uh, you have pastoral epistles. So they're epistles, they're letters, they're written to pastors. You got it. You can put it together. Um, the heart of this is really found in um, 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 15. You can see it up on your screen over here, right up there. And it says this, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And there's a lot in those couple verses to unpack, which we will unpack later in the series. But just for today, I want to draw attention to Paul's purpose, to Paul's heart in writing the letter. And it's really this, that, that Timothy, and then by extension that we will know, how we ought to conduct ourselves in the church of God. How we ought to live in the church of God, because the church of God is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And so how ought we to conduct ourselves? Now, I hear the wheels turning in your head. I get it. I, I, I can hear them turning, even though I'm recording this early. I You know, they're so loud, I can hear them turning. Oh man, here it comes. Here comes the morality sermons. Here comes the, you need to do this. You need to live by this. Here comes the heavy load of legalism. Here comes the heavy load of the law. You know what? Maybe I'll just tune out right now. Right? He won't know. It's pre-recorded anyway. He's not going to know if I tune out. Maybe I'll just tune out right now. I don't need to hear this. My life is, is, is kind of rough. It's kind of hard. I don't need somebody else beating me down for what I should do or what I shouldn't do. Don't do it. Let me encourage you, don't do it. Hang with me. Hang with me because there's fruit to be found here. Because the truth is the world we live in isn't a simple world. And navigating it can be hard. We live in a world where there are challenges at every turn. Distractions at every second. And alternate truth claims everywhere we look. What should we believe? Who is telling the truth? I mean, the reality, you, you can watch four different newscasts and you can get four different stories, excuse me, about the same event. So who do we trust? Well, we trust the Lord and we look to him. And so as we uncover the words of the Holy Spirit about how we ought to conduct ourselves, what we're going to find is we're going to find a clear path for our lives. And don't you want a clear path for your life? We're going to find straight roads for our feet. And don't you want straight roads for your feet? We're going to find wisdom for decisions. And friends, don't you want wisdom? 
And often I see such a lack of wisdom in, in myself, but also in the church. Such a lack of wisdom in choices. And we're going to find surety in those choices and find assurance in those choices. And so far from being a heavy load, God's word points us to a light life. It points us to a life that's full of joy, that's full of blessings. Uh, In fact, so full of blessings that there are too many to count. The great classic hymn, um, Great is Thy Faithfulness, has one line that explains it so well. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings, all mine, with 10,000 beside. And so as we embark on this series, I hope we find this reality. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings, all mine, with 10,000 beside. And, and in fact, in the first couple of verses in Timothy, um, they're exploding with blessing. And so I'm just going to read it. And, 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 you know, as I read it, I want you to think about what blessings Paul is talking about here. What blessings is Paul pouring out on Timothy or is, is identifying that Timothy has in his life? So we're just going to read it. First Timothy 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. By command of our God. Sorry, I'm going to start over. I messed that up. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is the this is the introduction to the letter, and it's a pretty common introduction in, uh, in the ancient world. But there's so many blessings. And, and honestly, like we read in Ephesians, We have every spiritual blessing that Christ has given us every spiritual blessing. No, not every, not every physical one. We know that we don't have every physical blessing in this world. We don't expect every physical blessing in this world. And honestly, those things are fleeting anyway, right? At any moment, and and we're so aware of it right now, at any moment, our health could fail us. Our, our wealth could fail us our job, our home, right? Those things could all fail us. They're fleeting. And our hope and our trust is not in them. But we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Spiritual blessings that will endure. And and by my count in those first couple of verses, I count at least seven. And I'm sure you could could find more in there, but I count at least seven different blessings to Timothy to start this letter. Now, you got to ask the question, why does he do that? Why does he do that in the letter? It's because Timothy needs to hear him. As we go through this letter, we're going to find that Timothy is not this Superman missionary, this Superman pastor, but he's very relatable to us because he's uh, um, a little bit timid. He's a little bit frail. He's a little bit worried. And, And so we're going to relate to Timothy quite a bit and so Timothy's in this place in Ephesus and he's getting battered down he's he's getting battered by false teachers he's getting battered and and beat down by people who are trying to grab authority when they shouldn't he's getting pushed down by help by his own health issues by rifts in the church by spiritual attacks and by the many burdens of leadership and Paul writes to him and says Timothy my dear son in the faith chin up God is our savior God is our Father. Christ is our hope, and Christ is our Lord, and from them we receive grace, mercy, and peace. Now, we might be going through the same things, but we have our own burdens to bear. Burdens about the health of loved ones or or our own health, about family or financial situations. We all have our own battles going on. I want to encourage you with a couple things from the beginning of Paul's letter here. First, you don't walk those battles alone. You don't need to walk those battles alone. Paul writes to Timothy, my dear son in the faith, and we can say to each other, my dear brother, my dear sister, let me walk with you. 
Let me lift you up. Let me encourage you. Let me lighten your burden any way I can. But when we keep our burdens hidden, when we, when we shove them down deep inside and we don't share them with anyone, it's really hard to help. So let me encourage you to be a little bit vulnerable. To be a little bit open and transparent. It's scary. It is. And you might get hurt. But I want you to trust that God's church is a safe place. And I also want you all to hear these blessings. Blessings that we possess. Blessings all mine and yours. There once was a young man who his father owned a factory. And the young man wanted to make his father proud and take over the factory one day. But all the jobs in the factory were already filled by others he felt were more qualified than him. They'd been there much longer. They knew what they were doing. And he just couldn't find a job in the factory where he really fit. There really seemed to be nothing for him. He despaired that he would never win the approval of his father or find his place without proving himself on the factory floor. So he resolved to work harder than anyone else. He resolved that he was going to work so hard that he would prove his worth even if he couldn't find a place. And in fact, he worked so hard that he worked himself ragged and he fell into terrible health. And so one day as he spoke to his father about this, his father was full of sorrow. The son could see his father was full of sorrow and the young man apologized for being such a failure. But the father quickly corrected him. He said, son, you weren't going to inherit the factory because you found your spot. You weren't going to inherit the factory because you worked the hardest. The factory and all I own was yours because you're my son. And you simply needed to be assured in that. And your work would have been a joy. If we want to answer the question about how we fit into the local church, we must first answer the question about how and why we fit into the church at all. We don't fit into the church on the basis of our service. We don't fit into the church on the basis of our work. We don't fit into the church because we have a job in the church. We don't fit into the church because we give money to it. We haven't earned our place because we're the most qualified or we've been here the longest. We fit into the church because we have been saved by God our Savior and adopted by God our Father and we have been placed here. That is the place in the church where you fit. And what great news it is to be saved. Right? Um, So often we can get tied up by what's right in front of us and forget this eternal perspective that we are saved. We are saved from, from wrath. We are saved from death. We are saved from the devil, saved from sin, saved from hell, saved by the work of Jesus on the cross who took our place and gave us life. You know, what, what hopelessness it is not to know that our salvation is a free gift. What, what hopelessness and burden it is to think that I need to work to achieve it. That sure, it was Jesus' blood, sweat, and tears that got me into the kingdom, but now it's my blood, sweat, and tears that i got to hold on with my fingernails to grasp on and work my hardest just to find my place so God will be happy with me. You'll never do it. You can't do it. You never will. If you think you're keeping your place in the kingdom by your good works, You're mistaken. And it's good news not only to be saved, but to be adopted. To be able to call God our Father. John writes, to all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God The kingdom, everything in it is ours. Not because we've worked for it. 
or because we've served, but on the basis of being his children. The victory is ours through Christ as a gift. We are saved and adopted. And when we know that, when we rest assured in that, then finding our place in the local body is a work of joy. Then my service to the local body, to, to my brothers and sisters in the church, my service then is born out of a heart of joy. Not to prove myself. Not to prove myself to anyone. Because I don't need to prove myself to anyone. Because God is my Father and He is the one who I serve and I serve out of a grateful heart to Him. We're saved and we're adopted. And God has lovingly placed us here to do His work. We sang a song to start this service called Hope Has a Name. It was, it was probably a new one to you and a, it was a new one to me and uh, I, I liked it. I thought it was great, but you can give me some feedback on the Zoom call afterwards. The chorus went, hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory. And then we followed up that song with God is for us in which we declared that the Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. And then we sang, I will follow. I believe everything that you say you are. I believe and I have seen your unchanging heart in the good things and in the hardest part. I believe and I will follow you. That's a great sentiment for us today. See, our hope in Christ is a personal hope. It's a hope that's grounded in a person. He is our hope. His work, His name, His person, His power, His grace. Our hope is not only in Him, but our hope is Him. For it's through Him that we have victory. It's through Him that we stand secure in that strong and mighty fortress of the Father's love. Apart from Christ, we are apart from God. In Christ, we are in God. There's no other way to get there. You can't work hard enough to get there. There is one way, and it is only through surrender. We have a sure hope. But not only do we have a sure hope, we have a Lord to follow. A good and powerful Lord who is worth following. A kind and mighty Lord who leads us and guides us by his spirit. One who is unchanging. And oh, I love that. I've, I've seen and I have, I believe and I've seen your unchanging heart. And if there's something we need right now, it's an unchanging heart. We need a Lord who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Because the world is changing around us. It, not only um, day by day and week by week and month by month, but a lot of times second by second. But Christ doesn't change. He is sure. He is secure. He is unmovable. And when you're out boating, when you're out doing that and you, and you set your anchor for your boat so you don't drift away, you want it to grab onto something not only strong enough to hold you, but something that's not going to move. Something that you can trust to keep you secure. Something that you can, you can trust to know that it's going to hold you in place regardless of what's come. And the same, and, and when we anchor our boats like that, it makes sense. And the same is true for the anchor of your life. Where will you set it? If you set it on anything other than Christ, you're going to be at the mercy of the winds and the waves of this world. And from that one Lord, we are given grace upon grace. Saving grace, sustaining grace. Grace that saves us from all our sins. Grace to regenerate our stony hearts and give us new hearts. Grace that was lavishly poured out on us when Jesus went to the cross and died for us. Grace that's by its very nature could not be earned but had to be freely given. And that grace continues each day. Each breath you take is a grace of God. God's sustaining grace is given to each of us each day, out of the fount of blessing, grace pours like a river to fill our lives. 
By grace we have been saved. By grace we have been forgiven. By grace we are adopted. By grace we set our anchor in the rock of Christ. And friends, if you possess this grace, let me encourage you today. Understand its sweetness. It's just as sweet today as the first day you accepted the gracious gift. And mercy. (laughs) We need mercy. You and I, we've done and we have thought vile, sinful things against God and against others. We've broken his laws. We've carried his name in vain. Not one of us has lived a sinful life. And in the very next section of the letter, we're going to see how the law of God drives us to cry out, to fall on our knees and cry out to the Lord for mercy. We need mercy. And God richly provides it. Mercy means we're free from the fear of retribution. It means we're free from the fear of punishment. It means God has looked upon our humble estate. He's seen our sins. He's seen our evil. And he's been merciful to us. One of the oldest prayers in Christianity is called the Jesus Prayer. And it tracks back to about 400. And the prayer goes like this. Jesus, Son of God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. The prayer serves as a reminder of our constant need for God's mercy and also of God's constant provision of mercy to us. And finally, the blessing of peace. I was talking to a friend um, about all that's going on in the world right now this week, and and, and he said to me, and we were um, just talking about everything that's happening around us, and in some ways, he he said this to me. He said, in some ways... Watching what's happening now is like watching a movie go on around us, but it can't touch us. How great it is to have the peace of God, to know that regardless of what happens around us, or even what happens to us if it does touch us, that we're going to be all right. You know, he's right. How great is it to feel that peace of God that transcends all things, that peace that transcends our circumstances, that true shalom of God which allows us to see the world from an eternal perspective that what goes on around us or happens to us and in us cannot shake the peace that Christ gives to his people and and one of the things that that saddens me the most about what's happened is is how God's people in many times instead of being people of grace and mercy and peace have brought the opposite. If we're people that have been have grace and mercy and peace poured out on us, then we should be the ones who are bringing grace and mercy and peace to the world. Are there times when mercy was required, but instead of mercy, you brought condemnation? Are there times where grace was needed? But instead of grace, you brought anger? Are there times when people around you need peace, but instead of peace, you've sown confusion and discord? Friends, I don't understand it. If we're not going to bring peace, if we're not going to bring grace, if we're not going to bring mercy to the world around us, then who will? No, I don't care where you land on any of the controversies that are going on out in the world right now. I don't care where you land politically, because the truth is Christians are political orphans. We're not part of any party and we can't be bought by any party. I don't care where you stand on, on vaccines. I don't care where you stand on government restrictions. There's no caveat in the scriptures for any of those things. Bring grace to one another. Give mercy to one another. Bring peace to the world. Be peacemakers. You know, unless somebody really agrees with this government. Have mercy on all people. You know, unless they think it's good to do this. I don't see it. What I see is God pouring out grace, mercy, and peace on us, poorable, wretched, miserable sinners. 
when we don't deserve it. And then commanding us and calling us to go out into the world and share that grace with other horrible, wretched sinners who don't deserve it either. If if anything in this message is going to set a tone for the year, let it be that. Let us be the ones who experience these blessings. Not just these, but ble- the 10,000 beside, to know that we possess these things in greater and greater measure every day, that if nothing else we know, we have been saved, we have been adopted, we have hope in Jesus our Lord whom we follow, and we have been given grace, mercy, and peace from above. And so if you're struggling with any of those, this is, a, this is the, the, your homework this week. If you're struggling with any of those, let me encourage you, choose one of those topics and focus on it this week. Pray about it. Read passages about it. Explore it. Listen to podcasts about it. Read an article about it. Um, listen to songs on it. Really drive it deep into your heart. If it's peace, if you're lacking peace and you need peace, then look at peace. If it's hope, then hope. Maybe you're struggling with self-esteem issues or doubt. Then take this week and look at what it means to be a child of God. Maybe you're struggling with addiction or mental health. Take this week and look at what the Bible says about hope. Maybe you're mired deep in sin and you see no way out of it. Look to the word of God for mercy. And then extend that to somebody else. So where do we fit in the church? Well, first and foremost, we fit right here. Right here with Christ our Lord. At his feet. In the family of God. In the household of God. Our place is secured not because of our work, but because of the work of Jesus. Our place is here. We are the children of the God of creation. You and I fit here. Here. And God has put us in this local body in order to be his hands and feet in this place. And wherever you're watching this, you are put there in order to connect to a local body in order to be his hands and feet in that place. You're not going to find any perfect church because there is no perfect church. And if there was a perfect church, it would be imperfect as soon as you joined it. But the imperfections of the church don't stop us from working out the blessings we've given in that local church. So as we carry on in this series, we're going to see how we fit into the specifics of the local church and how you and I can live for Christ in this context. And you might be thinking that that I didn't address where the church fits in the world, and you're right, because the reality is this. The church doesn't fit into the world. The church breaks into the world. It breaks into the world offering truth that runs counter to the claims of the world. It breaks into the world as a rebellious force, as a countercultural society that seeks not to bring reform, but rebirth. If you want to rebel in the world today, plug into a local church and faithfully and unashamedly follow and preach Christ. You want to be a rebel in the world today? Do that. So come with me. Come with me on this journey through these two letters. And as you do, I pray and I'm confident that you will see the great faithfulness of God. You will experience all these blessings with 10,000 beside. God bless you. Amen. Let's sing. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, 
thou forever will be. So you're sent out into this world, possessing all the blessings, all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms, as a child of God, as one who is deeply loved. You're sent out in the world to communicate grace, mercy, and peace to those around you. And now, to the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. May God give you grace this week. I hope to see you on the Zoom call 1130. That, uh, that link is on the website. If you're watching this on the website, it's right above this video. I hope to see you. And uh, I can't wait till we can meet again. In his name. Yeah.